Hello everybody and welcome to Drydock episode 87. Questions this week are brought to you by the video on the Hellenic ship Velos and the Wednesday special on naval boilers. So let us begin. Kulex81 asks, I've read that the 6 inch turrets in the Royal Navy's town class light cruisers were originally intended to have anti-aircraft capability, but in practice this proved to be a non-starter. Did anyone actually manage to make a viable dual purpose 6 inch gun? So a lot of people tried it, the French almost got there with the Richelieu's main battery, uh, not main battery, secondary battery sorry, but not quite. Um, as it turned out there would only be two countries that ever got a fully functional viable dual purpose 6 inch gun uh, working, that would be the US Navy with the 6-inch guns they mounted on the Worcester class, which were basically upgrades more of mounting than of gun for the guns that were used in the Brooklyns and such like. And the Royal Navy, again, using an upgraded version of what they had on the Town class, which they managed to get onto the Tiger class cruisers, although they did not initially want to do that. They initially wanted to put them, well, first on the Neptune uh class and then later on the Minotaur class, both of which designs did exist in the latter part of the 1940s, but both of which were cancelled on the grounds of... well Minotaur was ground uh, cancelled on the grounds of costs, Neptune was cancelled on the grounds that technology had advanced to the point that the Minotaur was a better design. But in either case, both navies, to a certain extent, achieved the holy grail that everyone had been going for since... A dual purpose 6 inch gun was the dream, effectively, because a 6 inch shell was perfectly capable of putting down destroyers very easily. It could give a pretty decent um, going over to enemy cruisers. It could even do superstructure damage and such like to battleships if it ever got to that kind of range. And then having it also have a rapid fire anti-aircraft capability absolutely perfect. Um, the fact that neither American nor British mountings were entirely successful is neither here nor there. Um, they had a tendency to have issues with jamming and breaking down and such. The American mount slightly more often than the British mount. Uh, but, well, you can't get everything right. Josh Thomas Moore asks, I've noticed a few ships like the Queen Elizabeth class and Iron Duke class had this sort of balcony promenade-like construction on the stern of the ships. What is it, and why is it there? As I can't find a reason for it being there, other than to give the crew a place to smoke away from the ammo. So these places were called all sorts of things, a stern gallery being one of them. They generally didn't serve too much for combat purpose. They were actually there to, as you can see with the doors there, to connect some of the officers' cabins. So they were an area for the senior officers to be and uh, hang out. They notice why the, all the railings are nice and fancy. Uh, they could also be used to receive dignitaries, host sort of afternoon tea and what whatever. Um, they are, to a certain extent, a hangover from the Age of Sail and the early part of the Age of Iron and Steam, back when all the officers' cabins, etc., were right up at the stern of the ship, which tended to be less and less popular as time went on due to all the uh, engine noise and propeller vibrations, etc., but there you go. Um, they were adapted on some ships for some form of combat. They could be used for lookout and observation, albeit not particularly brilliant at it due to a, a speed often having quite the uh, the wet experience and also obviously being fairly low down. Um, but on top of that, they could be equipped with light guns. There are some pictures of various uh, such galleries being equipped with small guns to help fend off torpedo boats and the like. Um, and they persisted in this mostly ceremonial dash uh, luxury role 
up until around about World War Two ish and then they were eliminated because one well one battleships big enough to actually accommodate these kind of structures weren't really around all that much and b flag officers eventually managed to get themselves moved to somewhere that was slightly quieter the big g asks i'm interested in your views on the battle of jutland it's usually stated the german fleet was fortunate to escape from the grand fleet but is that necessarily the case given the rate that british were losing ships due to their ammunition handling problems what do you think would have happened if the fight had continued is it possible that the british losses would have become catastrophic it largely depends on what parts of the fleet you're looking at. The dodgy ammunition handling practices that doomed so many of the battle cruisers at Jutland, and indeed some of the armoured cruisers, don't seem to have been present in the rest of the Royal Navy's capital ship fleet. Now, I know that some people do try and make that case based on what I personally find to be rather circumstantial evidence from various primary sources. However, I believe there is just as much evidence against it as, in fact, more. But the And I say that for a couple of reasons. One, HMS Tiger, relatively new to the battle cruiser squadron, didn't have the uh, as much of its flash protection removed specifically because the captain thought that pt's ideas were idiotic and was largely ignoring the orders to do so um, likewise fifth battle squadron also doesn't appear to have been following those practices and given the utter battering that the war spite took and indeed some of the uh, near-death experiences of HMS Malaya, if they had just as lax ammunition stocking and ammunition door removal procedures as the rest of the battle cruiser force, they almost certainly would have gone up like fireworks as well. And yeah, so based on that, it seems that ships that were either new to the battle cruiser fleet or had recently been seconded from the Grand Fleet didn't have these practices in place, which would then indicate that the Grand Fleet itself also didn't have those practices in place or if they had taken some kind of measure to improve rate of fire like say stocking some extra rounds in the turret they at least weren't doing that along with the flash door protection removal to quite the same absurd level as some of the ships under BT's direct command. Now granted that's not going to save necessarily the remaining British battle cruisers because well they don't have time to re-implement the flash protection in the middle of a battle um, but a lot of it's going to depend on how this fight continues because there well there are three main scenarios under which the fight continues all of which are very different all of which have fairly different outcomes and um this is by no means comprehensive. There are loads of different scenarios under which the action could have been continued um, during uh, the Battle of Jutland. But let's look at these three, because otherwise this is going to be a video in and of itself. So, option one, Sheer doesn't turn away when he comes into contact with Grand Fleet. He just decides to bull his way through and pull into a line abreast and start duking it out with the biggest battleship fleet known to mankind um, you can perhaps tell from that why he chose to turn away but never mind in that scenario it really does not go well for the germans that's because the british have effectively managed well not effectively they have managed to cross the germans t um iron duke apparently installed an aim bot just before it left scapa flow and the lead German ships were getting absolutely hammered. It was, in apart from the direction of travel east to west being switched, it was almost Tsushima all over again, um, in terms of the manoeuvring at least, not anything else. So if Scheer decides he's just going to keep bullying away into range of his guns, which bear in mind generally have a shorter range than the British guns, yeah, that the, yeah, sure. The, there's enough German ships to hurt the Grand Fleet and put some British ships down, or cr at least cripple them. But 
the British forces and the are just going to be working over each squadron of German ships as it pulls into line. Now, the the last few German ships will have that happen to them somewhat less because various elements of the ground fleet will be engaged with the German ships that have survived the initial mauling already. But at the same time, the rear elements of the high seas fleet are the weaker elements of it. So the fact they're only being fired on at two to one or three to one odds instead of five or six to one odds probably isn't going to go down too well with them anyway. So in that, in that scenario, the high seas fleet gets driven off or destroyed effect effectively then obviously various ships will make it away but there will be a lot of ships sunk a lot of ships crippled um and then probably either sinking on their own or sunk by follow-up assaults etc so th this is exactly why Shear did his battle turn away twice and you can pretty much put that scenario in uh, the engagement lasting in either of those battle instead of either of those battle turnaways taking place and just look at some of the damage that had to be repaired on the ships that were in that front line um on those front line units when they uh, had to turn away now the second scenario is probably the one that favors the germans the most and that is the engagement flares up again at night whilst the germans are trying to sneak behind the british fleet in order to head back to germany now, in this scenario, we would, I guess, we let's take a, a point of departure at that point, because, again, there could have been so many um, points where this could have happened. But let's say when one of the R-Class battleships actually legitimately spots part of the German fleet and doesn't report it, they, in fact, instead do report it, and Jellicoe swings his ships around whilst all the searchlights come on and you get this horrible close-range night action. This is probably the one where the Germans do the best because the Germans were trained somewhat, somewhat better than the Grand Fleet was for night actions. Now, on the other hand, they are battered, spread out, etc., etc. But if the, the timing is in their favour they've kind of crossed the rear of the British line. So they've got a sort of uh, slightly less organised, but still somewhat crossing of the T in reverse. Now, obviously, it's a lot easier for Jellico to swing his lead ships around to uh, address that issue than it is for someone who's sailing into a crossfire T uh, to get out of it. But anyway... So superior night fighting training skills, plus the fact that uh, obviously they've got their own destroyers and escorts nearby, plus an initial positional advantage over the Royal Navy means that in that scenario, the Germans have a fair number of cards to play, and they might well come out of that with a roughly even kill tally. Effectively, they're going to get more damage done at the start. And then as the various elements of the Royal Navy that were further south start to come back around, then they're going to start hitting the German ships that are already battered from the first round of exchanges. Then the last scenario, which is probably actually the worst for the Germans, probably even worse than sheer refusing to do a battle turn away, would be if this report again let's say was sent to Jellicoe but Jellicoe didn't choose to engage or perhaps he Jellicoe decides he's going to take yet another chance and trust uh, the intel that he's receiving but effectively for whatever reason Jellicoe decides I know where the German fleet is going um, and I'm going to position my fleet uh, over the entrance to their safe passage through the minefields and I'm going to force them to come through me to get back to Germany this is the worst case scenario for the Germans because their fleet spread out. They've already taken the battering that they took during the initial battle turnaways. Their battle cruiser forces are effectively non-combat effective. Seedlitz, Seedlitz is definitely going down in this scenario, even if no one fires another shot at her. Purely the fact that another few hours out at sea, and she's she's gone. Um, the German ships are strung out. If Jellicoe has got this intel, he'll have managed to corral his ships into some semblance of order. Um, so the Germans are at their basically at their weakest. The British, having sent Warspite and Marlborough home, uh, 
are really only short by a couple of battleships and everyone else is in good fighting trim the, the, and the Germans don't even have a break off scenario at this point they have to either fight it out and at that point they're quite badly outnumbered once you take into account well the sheer numerical disparity but also the disparity between ships that are damaged and ships that aren't or they've got to try and bull rush the royal navy at which point well it's death ride all over again except even worse um so yeah day if if we're looking at the daytime engagement scenario there's outside of Jellico turning into the mass German torpedo attack and getting it very badly wrong. Almost every daytime scenario which in which the High Seas Fleet continues to fight with the Grand Fleet ends badly for the High Seas Fleet. If we look at scenarios where the Germans engage the Grand Fleet at night, then they have a much better chance of things. They have a pretty good chance of pulling off, if they go full fleet battle, pulling off an even numbers loss loss uh, infliction ratio and if they are really smart about it they might bite off the back end of the British fleet and then skedaddle off into the night as best they can. BK Zhong asks the Kriegsmarine had high pressure turbines that were more efficient but also less reliable than those of most other navies. Is it possible that the Germans could have improved the reliability of these turbines had they had more time and resources? So the short answer is yes, they they could have. Um but uh, they didn't for various reasons, which I'll explain. Um and in order to explain why they didn't, most of which basically comes down to wartime necessities and also the uh, the usual German penchant for making everything hideously complicated. Well, I know there are some of you who watch this channel who either are or have served on uh, ships in the engine engineering sections. So I apologise for the following, because it's probably going to give you some nasty flashbacks or at least have you pounding your head to the desk asking why. But here we go, if I have to suffer through it as an engineer, so do the rest of you who've chosen to listen to it. The Kriegsmarine high-pressure boilers are the, an interesting bunch of things. Now, there's high-pressure and then there's high-pressure. Um, both Kriegsmarine and US Navy used high-pressure boilers in World War II. This much we already know. Uh, there were, however, some differences. When it comes to developing anything, especially something like a high-pressure boiler, which is basically a controlled steam bomb, um, you, you usually want to do a bunch of testing and steam can especially high pressure high temperature steam can be very very corrosive so you want to make it out of resistant materials um, alloys and such like the germans had several problems on this score they knew that in wartime the supply of rare exotic alloys would be difficult to come by and this did in fact um, end up costing them qu in quite a number of fields during the war historically with things such as their early jet engines burning out very quickly because they were forced to just use steel instead of um, various alloys that would help with that. Um, also with things like their armour-piercing ammunition for tanks, a lot of that ended up just being steel because supplies of tungsten weren't really around all that much. But with the design of the boilers, obviously most of their engineering was done for the boilers before the war but the engineers were specifically told to avoid these kinds of exotic alloys and unique metals as much as possible because then if something broke during wartime it would be very difficult to replace them now of course you could just build up a stock of replacement parts beforehand but apparently they the higher-ups didn't think of that and so the boilers went in and turbines went into service with a bunch of parts that were made out of more mundane materials that were nowhere near as durable when it came to dealing with extremely high pressure steam and the effects thereof. Additionally, the whole thing was somewhat rushed, so 
Normally, when you're designing something as delicate and important as your engine system, you would build a prototype, you would test that prototype, you would then go, aha, this bit doesn't work quite as well as it should. Um, let's change that. Let's see how it affects all the other bits. And let's then do another full scale test and so on and so forth until you've got most of the bugs worked out. And then you look at the layout of the pipes and such like, and you go, right, okay, can I get to this bit? Can I access this bit? No. Okay, well, if it breaks at sea, how am I meant to get at it? Uh, right, okay, maybe we should change that. Either put some more space in, move it around, etc., etc. And eventually, through a number of iterations, you end up with a system that is hopefully, A, less complex than your initial prototype, and B, a lot more accessible and more simply laid out. The Germans didn't do this they they kind of rushed the development to a certain degree and as a result the layouts were all over the place there were various bugs and problems that hadn't come out in the small amount of testing they had done that then would come out at sea and couldn't be fixed because you couldn't get at some parts of the boiler system without going into dock and hauling the whole thing out of the ship um and of course, having built a bunch of it out of less than ideal materials, there would be a lot more failures in the first place. Um, also, because the German Navy was kind of undergoing a bit of a crash expansion, they wanted to minimise the number of crew that were needed for any given task. So they went for an approach which is similar to what the Royal Navy has gone to with the Queen Elizabeth class carries nowadays, which is a lot of automation in their engine rooms. However, automation and 1930s and incredibly complex machinery don't mix tremendously well. And so the automated systems, they, they somewhat lacked flexibility to cope with some of the more unique and exotic things that can occur when you have a high pressure system made of substandard materials that's gone through minimal quality testing, um, which kind of meant that you ended up needing a bunch of people there to supervise it anyway um only you've now added another layer of, layer of complexity and thus another layer of potential failure points um the whole thing needed to be assembled by a lot higher grade of a uh, worker which was also in short supply because a general weld that might stand up to two to three hundred psi is probably not going to stand up to two or three times that much so specialist uh, people are needed they have a slower work speed therefore do you get your systems in service slower or do you try and get your systems in service faster by using people who maybe aren't quite up to spec and thus in bringing in more failure points to your system yeah now if that doesn't sound like a disaster waiting to happen it gets even better because you see the american high pressure boilers generally in world war ii at least ran at about 600 psi which was as we covered in the video on uh, naval boilers it, w it was significantly higher than almost everybody else and then you have the germans bear in mind the american systems by and large had been through all that quality testing redesign prototyping phase over a number of years and had also had various parts that were vulnerable to corrosion and such like built out of materials designed to resist them the germans one didn't and the germans especially when it came to the admiral hipper class went i know we shall take our little uh, overly complex hodgepodge and we will run it at a thousand psi that'll end well yeah i, I can hear the transatlantic head desking trust me i can um <laughs> It, it, it therefore comes as perhaps a little wonder that the Prince Eugen's almost entire engineering plant just quit once the the crew who had gotten used to keeping the blasted thing running went home. Now, the Americans looked through the system post-war and basically went, well, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. That needs to be made out of an exotic alloy and... This needs a complete redesign, but the basic principles are sound. Um, and then went on to develop 1200 PSI systems, some of which were not necessarily the world's most reliable bits of technology, but a little bit more reliable than the German stuff. But that was with 1950s and 60s tech. This was 
well, at the time they're being designed, late 1930s tech at best. So yeah, this is effectively a potted history of why the German systems went so horribly wrong a lot of the time. And from that, you can perhaps extrapolate what would have been needed to improve the reliability of, the, of those. Yeah, basically time and resources and lots of it. And, and perhaps also maybe, and I know this might be anathema to uh, some portions of the German population, it doesn't need to be hideously complex all the time. Simplicity can be a beauty in and of itself. Prototypical asks, so considering the size, weight and complexity, how hard was it to update the machinery in a warship? No prizes for guessing these questions are coming from the bottom boilers. So updating the machinery in a warship, specifically things like the boilers, it's simultaneously actually surprisingly easy and also hideously complex, which sounds like a complete tautology, and to a certain extent it is, but um, let me try and explain. If you are trying to upgrade the machinery, let's say in this case, the boilers of a ship, you basically have to do all or nothing. You, if if you try and update little bits and pieces of it in place, it's just going to take forever and a day, and something's probably going to explode at three, four hundred psi and kill everybody in the room. So probably don't do that. Um, <laughs> if you're going to replace the boilers, it's basically going to rip it all out and put new ones in. Which does sim. This is why I say it does simplify things somewhat because you basically just have to go right. Here's the here's the feed in from the water tanks and the oil tanks, etc. Right, cut and cap those. And here's the feed out for where the steam goes over to the turbines. Cut and cap that. Right, all of this out. Um, you do kind of have to open up a large enough uh, set of hatches and such in the ship to actually physically lift it all out, but most ships are pre-designed for that. Uh, the picture in the background, by the way, is the Battlecruiser Congo undergoing, in part, exactly this um, in dry dock so it's expensive it takes a long time and obviously your ship is not going anywhere until it's complete um, you you cannot dispatch a ship with half this process done but then and then dropping the things the boilers back in again it's a case of right well Fuel goes in here, water goes in here, steam goes out here, connect up. We happy days. Um, the, uh, the whole thing of having to replace an entire system does luckily mean that you can also then just drop an entirely new system in. But at the same time, the complexity comes in from, well, one, it is a, effectively part of a major rebuild of a ship. Two, Whilst you can accept the previous feeds, the fact of the matter is more modern technology might mean that you may need better fuel. And if you are lucky enough to be able to run on the same fuel, you might need to run it at different rates, at different pressures. It might might, well, it might need to come in at different places. Likewise, the steam output, if you've got higher pressure steam, then your connections might need to be different. They might need to be higher tolerance. You might need to have fewer fewer output pipes you might need to have more output pipes uh, depending if you're replacing the turbines as well um so as an overall engineering challenge uh, i wouldn't necessarily on a technical level put it at a fantastically high grade if you're going to put it on a scale of one to ten as an engineering challenge if someone said to me reboiler this ship i would probably say it's a six to seven in terms of how expensive and how much time consuming it is and therefore the sheer amount of work that has to be done yeah that's that's probably like a nine or a ten um there's very very few things beyond complete rebuilding of the entire ship that that match the amount of work that would that goes into re-engining something the size of a battleship or a battle cruiser um a door 2d322 asks how many stokers were there usually for the capital warships from pre-dreadnoughts through to the last coal-fired super dreadnoughts and were there many shifts as the work is most likely exhausting especially at combat speeds 
Um, it obviously varied by ship by ship. Um, if you're talking about something like a, pr a smaller pre-dreadnought capable of 16 knots, obviously that's going to need a lot fewer stokers than uh, some of the really big ones that were capable of a, a 17, 18, 19 knots, like, say, the Italias. In the latter stages of things, when you're talking about sort of the nine, late 1900s, early 1910s, Anything upwards of 600 crew could be stokers, so you'd probably be working in batches of about 200 at a time, um, which gives you some idea of the, the manpower involved. Um, and one of the attractions to, of oil firing was that, well, you didn't need stokers, which meant you could immediately cut your crew complements down quite significantly. And some of this perhaps can be uh, explained by looking at crew numbers of some of the British battleships since the, they were some of the earliest to go over to oil firing. So if you look at the King George V 1911 class and the Iron Duke class, their crew numbers, at least in their initial forms, run at the high 800s, sort of 860 to 890, depending on exactly the ship. Um, and this is with a mixture of coal and oil firing. Now, if you look at the Queen Elizabeth and Revenges, they are 20% larger by displacement, but their crews are not 20% bigger. Um, with that much more displacement and therefore that much more room and that many more things to do, now, granted, fair enough, they are four turret ships instead of five, but even so, you would expect a crew complement of somewhere in the region, if you've got sort of high 800s for the earlier ships, probably something pushing 1,050, 1,100. Um, but in fact... Their initial crew complements were about low 900s, or 920, 940. So they were only bringing between 30 and 50 additional off, uh, officers and men aboard a ship that topped out at well over 30,000 tonnes compared to the 25,000 tonnes of the King George V's and Iron Dukes. So that gives you some idea of the relative cost saving in men. And as I say, that's just moving from a coal fired with oil spray feature over to oil firing uh, the move from a pure coal to pure oil would be even more marked clone tool asks would the danish navy have posed a threat to the royal navy had the battle and bombing of copenhagen not taken place in and of itself no the Danish Navy was not a threat to the Royal Navy. However, the League of Armed Neutrality, which Denmark was part of, was a threat to the Royal Navy. And the one of the reasons that Royal Navy launched the first Battle of Copenhagen in 1801 at the time that it did was because ice in the Baltic prevented the navies of the other nations in the League of Armed Neutrality from sending ships to all join together. Because if they did, then that force as a collective whole, would have definitely been a straight-up threat to the Royal Navy. Um, but even without that, the general principles of the League of Armed Neutrality were threatening to the Royal Navy in a much deeper way, and that was that with the independence of the American colonies, the easiest and cheapest place to source various important naval stores especially things like whole masts, was Scandinavia. And the existence of the League of Armed Neutrality with the policies it had put in place threatened the British supply lines for that. And since things like masts and spars are vital for the continued operation of a fleet, the British couldn't let it stand. So with the ice still in place, they basically went up to the Danes and said, right, you need to come out of here, uh, come out of this league or else. And the Danes refused to come out of the league and so they ended up with the or else part um so yes uh yeah as i say in, in and of itself the danish navy on its own probably not a threat to the royal navy but combined with the allies that it had and with the objectives they were all trying to enforce yes it most definitely was part of a threat to the royal navy <laughs> 
Ez Bendit asks, The specifications for SMS Blucher seem similar to those of later Treaty-era heavy cruisers. How would she have fared in the post-war environment of naval treaties, assuming that she survived the war? The key word there, I think, is on paper. Yes, her broadside is uh, eight, just over eight inch caliber guns, um, which gives her a similar broadside to a lot of heavy cruisers. She has 12 of them overall, um, and her armor is fairly considerable. However, there are quite a number of drawbacks to the Blucher that would have made her very difficult to retain um, post World War One. For a start, she would have needed some kind of special exemption out of the uh, Washington Naval Treaty because she comes in at just over 15,000 tons at an absolute minimum, which is about just over half again as much more than what was permitted for cruisers. Also, her guns are technically slightly over, but to be honest, edging that into the treaty restrictions is probably not the world's biggest problem. But the inefficient layout of the guns as i say she's got she's got 12 of them but can only bring eight of them to bear on only one angle is one major problem the other is her speed remember the reason that she was caught and killed was because she was too slow for the environment she was in she was capable of just over 25 knots and that's nowhere near enough to keep up with her treaty era heavy cruisers now, fair enough, she is a pre-World War I vessel, so if she did survive to post-World War I, she could maybe undergo a Congo-style refit in the late 20s, early 30s, completely replacing her machinery like for like with modern stuff, which will up the power levels quite a bit, but whether her hull design is enough to allow her, even with that amount of increased power, to get up to something approaching uh, uh, acceptable for a heavy cruiser, say 30 to 32 knots, um, it's questionable. Um, if they were aiming for that kind of thing, you would have to go for full-on Congo-style complete rebuild. I mean, the Congos were a bit faster, and than than Blucher was, and still only just about managed that kind of speed range. Now. The other thing is, if you're rebuilding it, then you might as well take the time if you're replacing the old in, the old power plant with a newer turbine uh, power plant as well. That'll free up space on the center line, so you can bring those turrets, some of those turrets, in and maybe get super firing turrets instead. But at that point, you're basically creating a a, a treaty year a super cruiser, or at least a version of it. So you kind of start to get into a ship of the easiest type of thing because is a turbine driven modern boiled super firing turret layout rebuild of a blucher actually anything even remotely like the triple expansion engine 12 gun wing turret blucher that is the historical ship um so yeah we, th there's theoretical ways of rebuilding her in such a way as to make her a fairly effective combatant especially considering her increased displacement allows for significant increase in protection etc but whether or not germany would be able to do that they might be forced into doing that simply by maybe being allowed to retain her but not replace her for a good long while uh, but it would be expensive and inefficient to do so Chris Hopwood asks, what would be the next design of battleships for the Royal Navy if the escalator clause had been activated but the calibre was still limited to 14 inch? I guess we're just talking about a, a displacement uh, escalation at that. Well, assuming they're limited to 14 inches still, the escalator goes from 35 to 45,000 tonnes. So you've got 10,000 tonnes extra to play with. That's a lot. Um, I suspect they probably would have gone back to the initial finalised version of the King George V design with the three triple 14 inch as shown here and then probably gone right well 10,000 tonnes is an awful lot to play with what can we insert instead I suspect you would have seen an almost sort of Normandy to Lyon kind of escalation in as much as they would likely take the 
armor design, bow design, stern design, etc. Basically, the whole form of something like a lion class. Extend that so that you now have four barbettes, two four, two aft, super firing, etc. And then stick a fourth quad fourteen on it. I mean, even then, with extra length, additional armor, maybe a slight increase in width and the additional quad 14 even then you're probably going to get a little bit of change out of the uh 10,000 ton escalator so what you'd probably see is an increase in power as well which would be assisted by the the, the plug to allow for the uh the additional 14 inch turret so a bit more power using up some of that additional space get to a bit faster so for 45,000 tons I mean this is very much back of the envelope calculations but I reckon you could probably get a King George V but with well what were we at that point 16 14 inch guns and maybe going up 30 knots or so Emerald Leafion asks, which World War I era warships were the most impactful during the Second World War? Now, this is quite an open-ended question. I mean, the thing is, there are so many different ways you could say uh, impactful and define it that it's almost, you could almost point to half of them, to be perfectly honest. Um, I'll give you some examples, though. So, Starting from the ground up, submarines, not so much really, not really cruisers either because, well, to be honest, most of them were out of service and the ones that were were very definitely second line units by the, by the Second World War. However, destroyers are another matter entirely. Now, again, most destroyers were out of service, but you could look at, say, the Wickstash Clemson classes. Now, most of them were, well, some, a lot of them at least, were in service during World War I, and granted they were very much second-line units by the time World War II rolled around. However, they did make huge contributions in various fields, such as convoy escort with the ships for bases agreement between the US and the UK, and quite a lot of them also got refitted to various roles, such as attack transports and such, in the Pacific theatre. So whilst individually they may not have done all that much, albeit obviously something like Campbelltown is a notable exception, as a collective group they actually had quite a major impact during the Second World War. HMS Furious um, also technically counts. I mean, Courageous and Glorious got sunk very quickly, but Furious was technically in service during the Second World War, albeit not in the form that she would serve in uh, World War II. And although she didn't have any massive uh, successes that you can sort of point to, like uh, attacking the Bismarck or being at Taranto or whatever, she gave good solid service and provided many airstrikes, a lot of air cover, a lot of aircraft transport, etc. And the cumulative effects of that kind of work would be fairly substantial. So that, of course, moves us on to the big elephant in the room, which is the battleships and battle cruisers. Now, in that respect, moving through the various navies, it's relatively easy to eliminate the Italian uh, World War One era dreadnoughts, although they shouldn't be underestimated because whilst they didn't, again, do anything of any great spectacle, their mere existence, obviously alongside the Latorios later on, did tie down significant Royal Navy resources, which could very well have been used elsewhere in the Mediterranean. So again, how do you measure the impact? Is it they went and blew this thing up, or is it they forced the Allies to tie down so many resources, so many ships, etc., to keep an area secure? Because by one metric, the Giulio Cesare um, and its uh, similar ships didn't do practically anything. By the other measure, they did quite a lot. Then you go through, well, the French got knocked out fairly quickly, so obviously not a tremendous impact there. Um, 
the Germans, well, they had two pre-dreadnoughts, and um, apart from being there at the beginning of the war, again, not a tremendous amount to be said. The Soviets, well, they had the Ganguks, not that they actually used them for all that much, so that leaves us with the big three. The Japanese, obviously, they had the Congo class, as well as the Fusos, he says kind of kind of pushing it a little bit but the Fusas and the Isais didn't do a tremendous amount the Congos however did a fair bit of work in the Pacific campaign and they're very definitely World War One era ships so you could say they had a they definitely did have a big impact they actually accomplished a fair bit they tied up a lot of allied resources and although they did mostly end up getting blown out of the water for their troubles it took a fair bit to bring them all down so you, you could point to them. Then you've got the USA. Now, granted, most of the American World War One era battleships didn't actually actively take part in a fantastic amount of combat outside of Surigao Strait, but I'm pretty sure if you asked most Japanese troops during the island hopping campaign or some of the German troops at D-Day, how impactful do you think the American battleships were, especially that poor old sniper who ended up in a duel with USS Texas? I have a feeling they might have a slightly different opinion of matters. Again, this comes down to how much do you value the heavy shore bombardment that these battleships could have could give, and what other resources would have been tied up providing that cover if they hadn't been there. Plus, of course, their simple existence at Pearl Harbor provided uh, the ne the uh, reason for American involvement in World War II in the first place and well that is a huge impact um, obviously albeit that that came at the cost of quite a few of them being sunk and some of them temporarily some of them permanently then you swing round to finally the British and You've got the Revenge class, Queen Elizabeth's, and the Battle Cruisers. Obviously, Hood made a fairly big impact in pop culture, albeit that unfortunately not a tremendous impact on the overall course of the war. Repulse, equally, um, managing to get itself sunk at the end of 1941. Not a tremendous change in the war as a result from that. Uh, the Revenge class did a very good solid work, as did many of the unmodernised Queen Elizabeths on convoy escort, and again, they didn't do that much, generally, but say you look at something like Malaya scaring off the two Sharnhorsts because it was escorting a convoy, what would have happened to that convoy if it hadn't been there? How much damage could that have done? How much damage would German surface raiders have done? And how much how much more would Hitler have been willing to risk sending them out if those ships hadn't been there to allocate to this kind of convoy escort duty? And then, of course, you've got the the modernised ships, War Spike, Queen Elizabeth, Valiant, and Renown. Now, of those, I would argue that it's fairly clear that War Spite and Renown were involved in a lot more actions and therefore, you could say, had considerably more impact on the war. Uh, war Spite certainly had a considerable impact on German destroyer numbers, to say the least, and Renown, uh, again, running into the Scharnhorsts in a storm, sent them packing. So those two ships are perhaps probably the poster children alongside the Congos for sort of actively doing something quite substantial, especially with Warspite, as we alluded to Narvik. Warspite's also at the Battle of Cape Matapan. Warspite's also scoring the longest-range hit, mm, technically shared with a charn horse, probably. Um, that's, a, that's a very deep rabbit hole to go down when you want to discuss the exact ranges of those particular incidents, but anyway. Um, but... Whilst that might, those might be the easy answers, as hopefully I've covered in this uh, somewhat rambly section, there are all sorts of metrics by which you can measure impactful, and it really comes down to what what do you value the most, and where do the sort of the butterflies go if a particular ship or class of ship is removed um, to determine that. Matt Blom asks. How was the detonation timing for armor-piercing shell fuses determined? So a full explanation would require quite the in-depth video on exactly how shells work, but for a brief answer, uh, 
shells, especially the, well, the armor-piercing ones that you refer to, they work with what's called a base fuse. That is, the fuse is placed in the base of the shell, not the nose of the shell, for the very good reason that the shell, assuming it does its job, is about to hit anything up to a foot or more of solid steel, and so any kind of delicate mechanisms that you put in that shell are probably going to end up smeared across the shell before they get a chance to actually do anything. So the base fuse, obviously the back of the shell being the last thing that gets destroyed, will last just long enough to ensure that the shell can detonate properly. Now how this fuse works is that when there is a big violent deceleration, like say hitting a foot of armor steel, this initiates the firing mechanism. So a primer will immediately flash, and if that was it, then the primer would flash to the detonating charge, which would then explode the shell, and the shell would just almost immediately detonate. This is not ideal with an armor-piercing shell, because that means the shell's probably still going to be outside the armor or on its way through the armor. So instead, what they do is they insert a small compressed grain of black powder, and it can literally be just a grain, between the primer and the detonating charge. The idea of this is that the primer flash will ignite the grain of gunpowder. That will burn through, and obviously because it's stuck in a small tube, the flame can't spread around, it has to burn its way through. And once it has burned through, then the flame continues onwards, and that sets off the detonating charge, which sets off the main shell, and then the shell explodes. Now, how you set the timing for that is basically down to how fast does a grain of gunpowder burn. And this was subject to a lot of experimentation. And obviously, if you use a slightly smaller one, then it will burn much quicker. If you use a fractionally larger one, it will burn a lot longer. But it's not very much. As I said, it's, when we're talking about compressed grain, we are talking about tiny amounts of gunpowder because you're talking about how much gunpowder can burn after being set alight in hundredths of a second, which is was normally the uh, average delay because they had to calculate, well, based on the shell's speed before impact, based on the shell's likely speed after impact, how far is that going to travel? But if you're traveling at several thousand feet per second, or even at long distance a few hundred feet, several hundred feet per second, um, you only need a fraction of a second to travel the tens of feet that you need to actually get well inside your target, and obviously before the shell breaks up from the force of the impact. The only exception to this was the Japanese diving shells, which measured their delay in tenths of a second as opposed to hundredths of a second and so that is basically how you do it in very simple terms. Alastair Church asks, tank shells went down various different routes in their attempts to defeat the armors that they were pitted against such as shaped charge warheads, caps to help grip the armor when striking at an angle etc. Did naval shells have similarly varied ways of attacking armor or was it mostly a matter of throwing heavy enough lumps of metal that having enough armour to guarantee protection would make the, make the target so immobile as to be pointless, and then hoping your naval architect did a better job of designing a compromise than the enemy? There were various experiments with ways of attacking armour that were slightly unique as compared to the, the general case, but to a certain extent it is a lot more limited in scope than tank shells because, as I mentioned in other videos before, tank shells basically have to break through the armor and then once they've broken through the armor, as long as they're doing something on the other side, that's probably going to knock out the tank because there's very limited space inside a tank and all the vital parts are literally just there. Whereas just breaking the armor on a battleship really doesn't accomplish all that much because most of the vital bits are still further inside and there's a fair bit of space in between. So when it comes to the average or garden shell, when you talk about armor piercing varieties at least, the basic idea is to, as you said, hit something hard enough with something that's heavy enough and uh, durable enough to punch straight through the metal of the armor plate. But there were, broadly speaking, four 
additional ways of going about it other than the standard commonly understood armor piercing shell now two of these were effectively opposite ends of the spectrum and the other two were relatively unique now i've met, actually mentioned one of them briefly in the previous question and that is the diving shell the idea of the diving shell with its much longer detonation would allow for the shell to travel through the water where obviously it'll be slowing down quite significantly but then reach the target or ship whilst having reached a depth below where the armor belt was this in theory would then allow the shell to penetrate the relatively thin hull despite the fact that it was obviously significantly slowed down by the water and fetch up inside the vitals of the ship because right down in the depths is where you find things like magazines and engines and such like and then when it detonates a it's very likely to be near something that you really probably don't want a shell nearby um, and two obviously having penetrated underwater that means the resultant damage is going to definitely let in water which is another vital part of sinking a ship whereas a armor piercing shell that punches through five ten feet above the waterline will do damage but it's probably unlikely to let significant amounts of water in the other type of uh, sort of sideways look at things was the CPC or common point cap shell that was present in British warships in the run up to and during the early part of World War One. Now, this particular kind of shell was pretty much done away with as a result of the advent of the all or nothing armor scheme. It worked purely on ships that had the distributed armor scheme. And the reason for that was that the Royal Navy figured out that armor piercing shells could obviously punch through sort of a foot or so of armor but against lighter armor belts the sort of anything from three to seven or eight inch belts that were common in various parts of war aft up above and below the main arm belt on a lot of ships in the run-up to world war one the the, so the ability to punch through 12 14 16 inches of armor was a complete overkill and one of the major restrictions of having a shell that could do that was that your bursting charge, which, as I've said before, regulates to a significant degree how much damage you're actually going to do once the shell goes in, is rather limited. So they came up with this CPC shell, I guess later on you might call it a semi-armor piercing shell. It had considerably more explosive in it, almost as much as, a con as an HE shell, a high explosive shell, but it had a very basic and limited armor piercing cap. Now, granted, if this smashed into the main armor belt, it would just break up or detonate part way through, so it wouldn't be anywhere near as effective as an AP shell. But if it hit anywhere other than the main armor belt against one of these thinner pieces of armor, then it still had the penetration to go through. But when it did get through and went in, and obviously this would be very useful against not just most of a battleship by surface area but any cruiser or destroyer as well when it did explode there would be a heck of a lot more explosive involved which would cause an awful lot more damage and be making it therefore much easier to knock out the enemy ship the reason the all or nothing armor scheme did away with this was the well clues in the name there's either really really thick armor or there isn't and if there isn't really thick armor and there's just hole plating and splinter proofing you might as well fire a conventional HG shell there's no need for this specialized hybrid and if you're hitting the main armor belt which is where all the vitals are well that's when you need the really powerful AP shell the last two variables outside of the kind of standard gun are the high velocity weapons and the lower velocity almost mortar style weapons that's a bit of an exaggeration but you'll see where i'm coming from in a second so once ships had belt and deck armor and engagement ranges and accurate firing had reached a point where it was theoretically possible that you could be dropping shells on somebody's deck as much as you might be punching through their sides navies had a kind of a three-fold choice they could either go with a jack of all trades master of none standard gun which is usually about a 45 caliber weapon with a standard weight shell or you could go for high velocity which usually involved having a long barrel and lighter weight shells 
or just a long barrel and lots of explosive. But the general idea was to throw your shell out at extremely high velocities relative to normal. This obviously would give your shells a huge amount of kinetic energy, but also crucially, this would mean that the shells were fired at a much flatter angle. So whereas, let's say, a conventional gun to hit a target at 20,000 yards, completely arbitrary figures, might have to fire at 20 degrees elevation. So when the shell's coming down, there's this angle off of perpendicular, which is going to increase the apparent armor thickness and also increase the risk of the shell armor piercing cap being dislodged, going sideways, the shell tumbling, etc, etc. So it's a chance, it's a risk. There are ways to get around it. Um, chief monks which just hit them really hard. But anyway, the idea of the high velocity weapon would be that because it's going so much faster, you can maybe fire at only 15 degrees elevation. And so the shell comes in a much shallower angle, which means it's much more uh, of a perpendicular strike, which in turn imparts A, more energy into the armor, B, the armor's apparent thickness is much closer to its true thickness, and C, the shell performs a lot better because there's a lot less horizontal force exerted on it. That's one way of going about it effectively just ramping up the the power to punch clean through massive amounts of steel. The other way of going about it is to fire your shells at a much greater elevation. Now this increases your shell flight time, which can be bad. Uh, the, uh, this was another one sure the high velocity system was that the shells cross the distance very quickly, which made your fire con firing calculations easier, made it hard for the enemy to dodge. But anyway, a heavier shell you didn't want to fire much slower if you could avoid it because that would decrease your absolute armor penetration capabilities anyway but a a shell that was heavier and therefore had to be fired in a higher arc would be coming down at a much steeper angle now that would be bad when it came to penetrating a ship's belt armor because it would increase the angle and all the factors we mentioned earlier but it did mean that it might hit the enemy's deck a lot closer than a shell that was coming in very flat because of the, the gun shadows that are cast by the various arcs of fire. Now, if it hit the deck armor, the deck armor is much, much thinner. Apart from anything, it has to be spread out a lot more, so it can't be as thick as the belt armor unless you're really crazy British designers in 1945. The main strength that the belt, that the deck armor, sorry, has is that the angle of incidence when the shell hits normally is much, much higher than when it hits uh, the belt. So if a shell comes in at, say, what's taking our standard gun at 20 degrees, assuming perfect parabolic arc, which obviously isn't actually the case, but simple, simple uh, explanation anyway, um, assuming it comes in at 20 degrees away from perpendicular, then out of your full 90 degrees, if you translate that to hitting the deck instead of the belt, bear in mind the deck is horizontal, the belt is vertical, unless you've inclined it, that means it's hitting the deck at 70 degrees. And that kind of angle vastly increases the apparent thickness of the, um, the deck armor relative to the shell and also exerts an awful lot of horizontal force on the shell which makes it far more likely the shell is going to break up or potentially just skip off into the sunset. So with your heavy shell, if you fired it at the same range and you fired it at uh, 25 degrees, then obviously you're taking five degrees off of that angle when it comes crashing down onto the deck. And that reduces all those factors, making penetration of the deck a lot more likely. And as we said, since deck armor typically in the interwar period was three to four inches and even in the World War II period was five to six inches in most cases, apart from some of the much uh, much later battleships, it's substantially easier, at least on paper, to penetrate the deck. So this is what the super heavy shells would aim for in US ship design, for example. So there, was, there were other trade-offs in terms of flight time, ease of dodging, etc. Um, and of course, a high velocity shell would be very good at penetrating belt armor, but practically useless at penetrating deck, whilst a shell that was designed mainly to penetrate deck armor 
would have significantly more problems penetrating belt armor than a corresponding shell for the same gun that was designed more along those lines or more along the jack of all trades lines so yeah there were several different ways that you could go after the armor up to and including trying to bypass it but a lot of it was governed by the mechanics of ballistic flight and whilst there were a few attempts at clever types of shells the general uh, trend of naval design technology steered away from some of the more esoteric stuff that you'd see in tanks although one of the purposes of the armor piercing cap on a armor piercing shell was in fact to help normalize the angle by punching into and grip and or gripping onto the belt armor depending on obviously who's manufacturing the shell and what design that shell tip is and the only channel admin for this week is to say that the Treaty Cruiser Era de uh, design competition, uh, I don't know, I can't remember exactly when that deadline was passed, but I'm just going to say arbitrarily now the deadline is one week from the uh, release of this video. So that'll give people some time to get everything sorted. I know there's been a bunch of entries already, so... Uh, thank you for bearing with me on that. Obviously, it's been a little bit of a chaotic time for the last uh, last few weeks, and so uh, that kind of thing, unfortunately, has gone up in the air a little bit on my end. But other than that, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you again in another video soon.